So, I've been asked to make a video showing how to install a line set on a canopy. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, overview of, of what we've got this set up. I've already done my prep. So I've laid the parachute out so that the nose is facing to the left with the tail to the right, and I've cleared each loaded uh, rib on top of itself. So what does that mean? Well, if I take a look at the bottommost cell, which would be the right end cell, I've laid it down and then I've cleared this material all the way through on the seam that has the line attachment points. That's the loaded seam, U being the load of fatty under the parachute. I've done this for each row, so I've got them all nice and neat. You'll notice I have all the A-line, oh, sorry, all the A-line attachment points arranged together here like so. And because this parachute is elliptical, the B's don't quite line up right on top. And then the C's start to get quite displaced, and the D's are very displaced to the extent the upper steering line number one on each end cell is real close to them. And I've put a pull-up cord on here just so we can identify that these have nothing to do with suspension lines there control lines and we'll deal with them later. Um, when we removed the lines we were incredibly careful not to damage a parachute. I can't tell you how often I've seen a canopy come to us that they've removed the lines but they've damaged the line attachment point or some other thing. So generally if you're sending us a parachute I do not recommend you do that. I appreciate the help but it usually ends up being not the best idea. Um, while the lines were removed that was also the best time to do a thorough inspection of the canopy. And had we found damage, it's far easier to patch it or remediate any damage when you don't have to wrestle it around the machine with its lines. The next thing I'll do is take a look at my line set. And I'm going to first check that it is the line set for this parachute. So I'll have a quick look at the manufacturer's label. It says it's a Crossfire 1, size is 89. And then I'll pull out my line set here and I'll similarly check that it is so labeled. And it is. Hallelujah. We're off to a good start. And then I'll quickly just drop my A lines, C lines, and cascade lines and control lines down on the table. And I'm going to check that all the bar tacks are present and that I don't see any obvious damage. This will save me doing a, an extensive double check later on. So two, four, six, eight, ten. Fantastic. And in counting those tacks, I also now know that I have the correct amount of lines. Now, I don't necessarily know that I have the correct uh, amount of each line that I'm supposed to have, but it's off to a good start. And on these lines, one end has a large loop and one end has a small loop. And by large, I mean, oh, call it an inch and a half, and at the other end, call it three quarters of an inch. The small loop end goes to your link. The big loop end goes to your canopy. I'll just throw them out here. So there they are, all laid out in their pairs. A54321, C54321. Now let's get ready to start installing them. So let's take a moment now to look at the numbering system for the lines on this parachute. Just like any parachute, the lines on the front are the A row, then followed by the B, C, D lines and control lines on the tail. On this particular canopy, A1 is the center, then A2, 3, 4, move into 5 on the end cell. And then that's repeated on each row. So B1 is center, B5 is end cell, etc., etc., through the C's and D's. This particular parachute does have D's in the 5 and 4 position. Sometimes on very elliptical parachutes, you'll find that those positions, uh, and other positions for that matter, are left empty because the canopy is so skinny at the sides, it doesn't need that extra line. If we take a look at the control line numbering system, it starts with 1 at the end cell, so the most outside control line is one, and then the next seam, which would be the unloaded rib on this parachute, 
doesn't have a line. If it did, it would be the number two position. The next line, next control line is in the three. Notice how even though the two position was empty, they didn't reuse the number, so they missed it. They just went one, empty, three, and then four, and then five. So those are the numbers on this canopy for the UST lines. And let's just do a thought experiment. If it had more, let's say it was a tandem, it might have a six, seven, and eight, for instance. So those are the line positions that we're going to abide by as we install our lines. And just give me a moment, I'm going to bring this up at a side angle now, I'm going to try to. I don't know how much value there is in this, but we'll take a quick look at it. So the way we have the canopy right now is laying down on its side with the nose facing to the left and the tail to the right. So essentially, A, B, C, and D5 are down on the table, uh, that being the right side, and then it goes 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, until the left end cell is uppermost, which is A5, B5, C5, D5, and control line position 1. I think I've beaten that to death, uh, and I hope you get the idea that it's all now just compressed down. So here we are at the nose of the canopy. And if we take a moment just to look at the line attachment point, you can see which way the line used to leave it. So it terminated going essentially towards me. And I want to replicate that. Uh, now in fairness, I've seen it both ways on every possible line position and it doesn't seem to make any difference. But for the sake of a neat appearance, let's keep it consistent. So I know this is the 5 position because I can see the stabilizer here. That's important that we start in the right place. And I have two different techniques. I'll show you both. You pick what works. The first technique is I slide the large loop over the line attachment point, open it up a little, the line attachment point, and then pass the remainder of the line through it, being careful not to remove the label. And where possible, try not to dislodge the label because we're going to need that for our double check later on to make sure we did indeed put them in the correct locations. I'll now just twist the line so I can set it into its line attachment point. And now as you can see it's terminated and coming towards me which is what I was shooting for. So that's the end cell on the bottom or the right side. Now I'm going to do the left side here and I'll set I'll do this through a different technique. So before what I did was slide the loop on and pull the remainder through. This time what I'm going to do is pass the loop through the attachment point and then take everything and pass it through the loop. And now I'll just flip that around on itself so it locks head into position and set it up like so. And you'll see in a minute what I do with the lines as far as laying them out on the floor when I widen out this shot. Uh, but what I will do now is put the lines in the four position, so move up one, then the three positions, two positions, and actually that's a good example because I, I lost one there, there it is, so four, three, two, one, one, two, three, four, but I'll do them as pairs and I'll pay very close attention to make sure that I don't go out of sequence. Obviously if you do, you want to catch that before you bar tack and then rearrange the lines in the correct sequence. One last thing, if you have any problems getting a line through, it is okay to use a hemostat, but be incredibly careful that when you clamp it on the line, clamp it very tight so there's no abrasion. Um, some manufacturers do have an extra bar tack on the uh, lines on the end cell in the A position and it makes it for a very small loop. This can be useful, but I would say be be cautious. I would not rush to use this tool as it can damage the lines. So as I promised, the way that I then sort these lines is I take the bottom one and move it to the right and the top one and move it to the left and then lay them down. Now I go and get my fours. I double check that it is indeed a four and we'll just repeat this process many many times. So I'll go to the bottom one So what I'm going to do now is hang my 10 
cascades in the V line position. This usually goes a little bit quicker. Uh, you don't have to walk them out, just let them drape where they fall. And I've separated them off into a group of 10. That way I know I got them all. It's a bit of a no brainer, but nobody ever said I had the biggest brain on earth. So now I'm going to hang the 10 cascades for my D line lines. And I want to again just bring your attention to the fact that on the end cells, this line attachment here, which you can actually see his face in this way, is a suspension line attachment. So this is the D, and this is the C. We've already got A and B under control. And now it's time to hang the C lines, starting with five. I'm going to take a moment now just to move the labels and make sure that they're about an inch above the mark, the dot, that's on the line for the trap end for the cascade. So let's start getting these uh, lines attached to each other now and set up. I'm going to start out by grabbing the C5 on the right side, make sure I'm running under everything. And one profile of the line has a slightly flatter dimension and I'm running it back so there aren't a bunch of twists in it. I'll take all the twists out and I'm going to put it over here on my line stand. Uh, and if you can see this, this is about the simplest line stand you can get. You could end the hardware store, buy yourself a cheap step ladder, something that you'd never want to stand on, and then get yourself a loop, uh, sorry, a loop line with a loop on each end. And I'm now going to put this line on this loop like so and then just drop it over a hook. So I don't have to mess around again untangling the line. And I'm also going to leave it so there's quite a bit of slack, quite a dip in the line here. Otherwise, I'll be fighting that when I trap into it. Now, don't hang them all up. Start on the bottom one and do it this way. Now, as you watch this, some of you are going to think there has to be a better way of doing this, and that's cool. Fight me. Do it your way. I'm groovy with that. Uh, but this is the way I've found to be easiest and for lots of reasons that I probably won't go into. Now that I've got my C5 on, I'm going to physically touch this line attachment point with both hands and in a minute I'm going to stick the line in my mouth so I will stop talking. I'm now going to put both hands there and move my hand back until I hit the D line. By physically doing that and then moving down the line, no other line can get caught inside um, this area. This triangle will stay clean if you will. That will become easier for me to explain in a minute. I'm now going to trap the cascade into the main uh, suspension line by using a wire fit. We'll probably take a look at that later too. When I brought the cascade back, I made sure it wasn't twisted or tangled. And that's the, sorry, twisted I should say. That's why I kept it in my mouth there so that it didn't, I didn't drop it and have to walk it back up. I'm now just going to cinch the cascade back to line up the cascade mark with the mark on my suspension line. I'll show you that in greater detail in a minute. I'll move the camera. I now move up one row to C4. And I'll bring my hand back. I'll double check that it is C4 before I go any further. It is. And I'll bring this line out like so and drop it back onto my loop. I'm just realizing I should have shot this from the other angle. Ah, well, I'll do that in a minute. I'll now put both hands on that point again, bring my hand over so nothing else can get caught in there, and bring the line back. So what I mean is, I'm going to now drop this, which I would never do. If I just reach in to grab it, I could grab the wrong one, it could be through or around uh, the wrong place. But by putting both fingers on that line attachment point, bringing it back, and then bringing it to myself, I eliminate that possibility. Trust me, it's worth it. It feels juvenile, but you want to do it. So I'll put the fit about uh, 12 centimeters, 
four and a half, five inches downstream of the mark and then I'll put the foot in making sure it stays in the center of the weave. I don't want it popping out and going back in. And then I'll bring it out right on the mark. Don't be sloppy about that, eh? There's no reason to. If you're going to do the job, do it right. And then I'll take the tail of my cascade and I'll put just a little bit of it in there. Not too much or it's hard to pull through the line. And I'm not going to twist the cascade. Oh, I'm off camera there. I'm not going to twist the cascade. I'm going to leave it in as I pull it back. And then I'm going to milk the two marks. Hope you can see this. Let's see. There we go. Two marks until they line up like so. So I've got my cascade mark on top of my line mark and I'm going to milk the slack out of the line making sure I don't leave a tail. If you do leave a bit of a tail, pull the line out and re-trap it. It's not going to get better if you leave it overnight or give it two aspirin. So cure the problem now or you'll just forget and you'll do a crappy install. Don't do that. Now I'm on to the C1 on the other side of the canopy, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the next five lines on a different loop. just makes it easier for the assembly later on so we get them on the link correctly. Now on to the A lines tree, repeating exactly those steps. I'll make sure to start out in the right place. Okay, now before we install the control lines, I want to take a generic look at some different options. I hope you can see this. So these are three different fake upper steering lines that I've done. One of them has a single dot. One of them has two dots that just are a little over an inch apart. And the other one has two dots that are about three inches apart. So if you receive a line set that has a single dot version of an upper steering line, the correct method to attach it is to insert your control, uh, sorry, insert your FID downstream of the dot, come out at the dot, pass the UST line through the appropriate line attachment point, and then just bring it straight back into itself as a straight loop. Cinch it up and then put just enough slack in there that the loop is not crowded. If you have the two dots that are close together version, insert the tool downstream of the second dot, or the most inboard dot, if you will. Bring it out at that dot. The, da the inboard dot as opposed to the outboard dot. Pass the line through the, its appropriate line attachment point. And this time when you cinch it up, you're going to go dot to dot. So you've got a straight loop dot to dot. And then probably the most common version is where you have the two dots at about a three inch space in. Same start as always. Insert FID downstream of the inboard dot. Oh, popped out. Let's go back in. I'm trying to go too fast here. Never a good idea. Come out at the inboard dot. So there's my second dot. This time, pay attention. This is going to get a little confusing, but it shouldn't. I'll go through the appropriate line loop, and then I will pass the running end of line around the back and on the inside of the line attachment point. I'll then pass the running end into the tool, making sure I'm not twisting it up, and I will insert the line like so until the two dots match and then I'll just milk out the slack to give me a lark's head knot.
Now I'll take my control line and I'll anchor the toggle loop down on my stand, walk it up and I will find whatever the most outboard UST is. On this parachute that's UST number one as we saw on our diagram this morning. And this is the two dot versions where they're three inches apart. So that was the UST leg one. You'll notice the UST line comes down to the LST and then goes back. So it's the same line that's doubling back. That one won't necessarily have a label on it, but it's the other leg, so it goes to the very next position. We saw earlier that position two on this parachute is empty, so that would make this UST number three. And I'll be careful to make sure it's running flat and in the most logical fashion it can to the canopy. Now we'll find the next one, label UST4, and again I'll be careful that it's running logically, it's not taking some circuitous route that does not make sense. Make sure it's running flat. And lastly we'll take the other leg, which must inevitably be UST5 on this parachute because we've already got one, three, and four. So that's the only game left in town. Doesn't really matter to me how you do the next steps. If you're not comfortable working backwards in your mind, just find the uh, appropriate piece of parachute on the table. I'm going to try and work my brain a little and make sure that I can still get this right. So I'm going to start at five and I'm going to work toward one. Now it's going to so what I've done now is rolled my bar tacker into position at the A-line traps and I've selected the appropriate pattern that will be long enough yet thin enough. Uh, this particular machine does a center start bar tack get over it for those of you that think that's super important it is not parachutes were made for decades without center start bar tacks and many of them are out there still including many of the tandem reserves that I've had the fortune to use it is not unheard of now for some manufacturers to use straight stitches on lines that don't stretch like Vectran, Kevlar, HMA so if that's all you've got we'll talk about that later I'm going to be very careful as I step inside these two untacked line groups as I don't want to dislodge the work I've just done because that would be foolish. And I'm going to tack as close to the insertion point as possible otherwise it can kind of cavitate on itself and it will slowly chafe away and I have seen lines that have cut the line they're trapped into. I've also removed the automatic knives from this machine because I've found that the loose tail, even though it will do the tack, is not as nice. Here you can see the control lines being tacked. And now it's time to trim everything out nice and neat. Let's take a look at one of the most confusing things you have to do on the install now, which is called stabilizer slack. If you take a look at the trim chart, you'll see on this parachute the B line has one centimeter of stabilizer slack. So to achieve that what you do is take the line making sure it's fully seated, place it at the point at which it sews to the stabilizer and pull them both under moderate tension making sure this seam is elongated. So now they're zero, they're equal to each other. 
And what I want to do is put one centimeter of slack into the stabilizer. So I put my measure next to the end of the stabilizer and then I mark one centimeter up on the line. So when I line up the line with the end of the stabilizer now, the stabilizer never comes under load. All the load is transferred through the line to the parachute. If you do this the wrong way and you put the slack in the line, now the stabilizer takes the load and you will rip it off there. So be careful. Also, when you sew this line on, there is a metal washer in here. I don't care how good your bar tacker is, it's not going through that. So be careful. Now let's do the C line, which hopefully you can see where the last tack was removed on this. Again, we'll bring them both to zero. And this one gets two centimeters of slack. And then lastly, the D line, and this is the easiest one to mess up. Put the line where it's going to sew, and then carefully elongate this loaded row here until you get a good zero measurement. And this one gets three centimeters of slack. and tack the stabilizers in place. Now we do a final inspection of the parachute, making sure none of the lines are through each other, everything's in the right place, and all the tacks are present and nothing was damaged during the install. Now we measure the lines, make sure it is in trim, uh, and that we didn't miss anything. And finally, rigor roll it up, and that is your reline done. So here's what I used for a line stand. It's just a cheap set ladder with some hooks put in it that I filed off any sharp edges. And then I make a, a loop of line with a loop at each end so that I can drop lines onto it as I go. I'll finish it up like that. Pretty simple stuff. And the tool we use to trap the lines is this. This is a wire fid. Don't buy one. They're super easy to make. Go to the hardware store, buy some piano wire, bend it, and then drill a hole in a dowel or a piece of wood, slide it in there, some Gorilla Glue to hold it. So super good tool, free, perfect. So let's take a moment now just to go over a few things that didn't really fit well into the video. Uh, but might be useful to you. As I said, it's not unheard of now for some manufacturers to sew their lines using a straight stitch. Um, I'm using two different colored lines here, hopefully just to try and uh, get you to see the difference. So the blue line in this case is the cascade trapping into the steering line. And you'll notice it's got a straight stitch all the way down where the line is inserted. And it goes about a half inch, about a centimeter, past the end of the insertion um, where it thins back down into a single layer and it's back stitched about an inch at each end. As long as you're on a line that doesn't stretch it won't uh, break this stitch and it should last. Um, here's a picture from Icarus of a brand new uh, JPX, I think that's the layer and you'll notice they have sewn the link and canopy loop using a straight stitch. I'm sorry it's a little blurry, it's all I've got. Um, and if you don't think they know how to make a parachute, well, you take it up with them. I'm not going to waste my time on that. Now let's take a look at a tack that went over the edge. Not good. This might even hold potentially, but it looks like hell. So just untick a, unpick a tack like that if you ever see it and redo it. There's just no excuse. I'm not going to lie to you, I've seen them come from the manufacturers like this incredibly occasionally and I wouldn't bother calling them to annoy them. If they do it 1 in 10,000 or 1 in 100,000, let's give them a pass, eh? let's not be that annoying guy. I mentioned earlier in the video that if you tack too far away from the insertion point, it can allow the line to cavitate. I'm not even sure that's the correct word, but either way it can abrade on it like so 
Um, and if I hadn't seen this with my own eyes, I think I would tell anyone they were crazy if they thought that was true. So what you want to do instead is try and get your tack, tack very close to the insertion point to eliminate that possibility. And then here's another common mistake when you leave a tail sticking out if you've just uh, not allowed sufficient distance to include the trap. Now I wouldn't necessarily have you unpick this tack. tack. What I'd do instead is milk the line that's on the inside back a distance, take a razor knife and cut it at at least a 45 or better still a 30 degree angle so you get rid of the offending piece and then just milk the line back over like so. Well, in the words of the uh, good Dr. Forrest Gump, I think that's all I have to say about that. Um, but I want to get in the habit at the end of these videos of thanking people who've been helpful to me in learning what I know. I certainly didn't invent most of these wheels. I copied them from other people. Um, I'm tired of the amount of bomb throwers in our business that are out there bad-mouthing each other on Facebook or drops on. And I don't want to change the world, and I'm probably making a mistake putting this on there here, but come on, folks, we're supposed to be working together. We're all in this uh, to have a bit of fun. And, uh, but I'm going to thank on this one Billy Bradshaw from Lake Wales, Florida. He uh, was kind enough to tolerate me when I knew nothing about nothing and wasn't smart enough to know how little I knew. So thanks very much, Billy. And that's uh, wind line or downwind. Uh, the guy is amazing. Uh, probably the real father of the hook turn, the swoop landing, but that's a story he can tell you. And if any of you see Billy Bradshaw, please say hi from me. My name's Simon Wade.